I'd like to share with you today a recipe for making gold. Now, it's not what you think. Uh, we normally think of gold as an, something an individual does. So, for instance, the story of Rumpelstiltskin is a very popular one. What I'm talking about is systemic wealth, which is how do we govern our communities, our cities, our countries to create wealth. This is something I've been looking at for a long time, and it's a fundamentally different problem because what you do hands-on is very different than what you do at a system level. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. This is a bit of a story uh, to kind of take you through the thinking behind this. But I'm going to start with the story of a bug. So this is a bug that's actually profoundly affected our lives. In fact, people consider this bug a potentially the worst agricultural pest in North American history. This is the cotton boll weevil. And about a century ago, people were terrified that this was about to destroy the American cotton industry. Uh, it was invading up from Mexico. It had made it to Texas, Louisiana. It was going through the Deep South. And people were very scared because the cotton boll weevil wasn't just going to destroy an industry. It was going to destroy an entire way of life. And so, if you move forward now, in 1902, uh, this gentleman thought he had the answer. The gov U.S. government actually tasked this man, Seaman Knapp, to be the guy to take on this very simple challenge, which was stop the boll weevil and save the American cotton industry. And so he took on this challenge. And what's interesting about this at the time is that this very daunting challenge is that Seaman Knapp knew something that other people did not know. He knew that the answers on how to increase cotton production, even in difficult environments, was actually already known. People already knew how to do this. The problem was, it was the people who weren't the farmers that knew it. And so he, he realized that we had to find ways to, to transfer knowledge from the experts, the university scientists, the researchers, who were actually studying how to increase cotton yields against boll weevils, and transfer that over to people that were implementing this in the field. And so what he did, starting in 1903, in Terrell, Texas, as the first test lab, is he actually started doing test, test sites. This was a form of university extension, to take the ideas from the university and move them out into the real world. And it was incredibly successful. Uh, they ended up taking this idea and spreading it all over the country. The idea of university extension, in fact, was born out of that. If you've ever been to a university extension class, you're living in the legacy of Seaman Knapp. Uh, what's interesting about this model is not just that we save the cotton industry, it's that this idea that knowledge could be taken from experts and multiplied and scaled across entire civilizations has affected the way we think of technological innovation today. It's not only, not only that, it's affected the way we think of governing our entire societies today. And this is very interesting because it flies in the face of what's happening in the economy today. And it's created an interesting contrast that I want to share with you. So this idea that it just takes a few smart people and then we take their ideas and we build them and scale them and made its way through the industrial economy. So this is World War II, the building of fighter planes. Same idea. It takes a few smart people with some great designs and lots and lots of people to take these ideas and build them. Uh, but the economy has really changed because we're in an environment now where you can't just play, uh, make things in planned ways. So we like to talk about the contrast between plantations and rainforests. So on a plantation, you know the crop you want to grow. And you decide that in order to make money, in order to do this well, we have to make as much of this crop as we can as efficiently as possible, and as cheaply as possible. That's the modern production economy. And it worked very, very well for a long time. And if you have, if you have a weed on a farm, what do you do with a weed? Well, you kill it, right? You don't want weeds, because there are these unpredictable things that aren't giving you crops. We contrast this with rainforests. In a rainforest, what's a weed? Everything's a weed. And when we think of rainforests, we think about the growth of weeds because that little tiny thing growing out of the ground could be the most valuable plant in the whole forest. You just don't know it yet. It's an experiment. It's an attempt. And so when we think of our economies today, you can think of weeds. Think of companies that are the most valuable ones in the world today, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or you name it. What were they 10 years ago? Could a group of smart experts have predicted them? The answer is no. Nobody could have predicted them. And so when we think of our modern economy, it's less about taking a few smart people and scaling their ideas up. It's actually more about how do we unlock the collective genius of everybody, because good ideas come from everywhere. And so we have this very interesting paradox, because crops are harvested most efficiently on farms. 
but good ideas. Weeds sprout best in rainforests. So we have this very interesting contrast, and the challenge then is how do you move from one world to the other? How do you create environments where you can take ideas out of rainforests, and how do you deal with the fact that the markets, big companies, have to deal with plantations? What we've noticed as you take ideas and turn weeds into crops is that there's different values at work. Uh, I work in Silicon Valley. I build companies, but I also think about the systems in which uh, new, new innovations and new ideas emerge. And these values are very, very common systemically in places like the Valley, in the, in the startup space. Openness, diversity, serendipity, the unexpected things, fairness, experimentation, play, and giving. Now, these all sound like very positive things. What's interesting is on the crop side, about plantations, we look at things like excellence, loyalty, dependability, success, quality, precision, reciprocity. Those things sound pretty good, too. And what's interesting about these ideas, too, you might notice, is that they're paired up. They pull in opposite directions. So the ideas on the left actually push you towards chaos, towards unpredictability, towards uncertainty. And the things on the right push you towards certainty and predictability. And so when we think about innovation systems, we're actually talking about designing environments where we have these dual sets of values at work, where we can handle the uncertainty and we can also handle the certainty. One of the questions people often ask us is, well, how do you design rainforests? How do you design environments where people are doing unpredictable things and they're inventing and creating together? Because ultimately, all of this is about people-to-people -people relationships. And what's, what they've been doing in places like Stanford, this is a class that they've been running for about three decades now, and this class focuses on designing rainforests. But they don't say that. What they talk about is product creation and invention. But does this look like a farm or does it look like a rainforest to you? It's very much a rainforest. It's about diverse people who've never met each other before, interacting in ways, learning to trust each other, and collaborating and experimenting and building. You can intentionally design these types of systems. What's interesting about this idea is that how can you take what we know about the way we make products and teams and start to scale them up? Can we take the underlying fabric of the ideas that are embedded in these types of environments and start to think about how we scale them across whole communities or cities or countries? This is a pr profound realization, and what we found in our work is that because all innovation happens at the level of individuals and small teams, there are certain traits that underlie all human behavior when we talk about systemic wealth and systemic innovation. One is fear. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the unknown? Are you afraid of taking risk? Are you afraid of reaching out past your comfortable boundaries? This permeates all human affairs. And in environments that are highly non-innovative, in countries where there's not a lot of innovation, not a lot of economic wealth, we see fear everywhere. It's also about trust. It's about who do you trust? Do you just trust your close friends and family, or do you trust diverse strangers? Are you willing to take a chance with people that you just met? This sounds simple, but it's actually very complex, because in the process of building new ideas and new innovations, you need everybody at the table. The ability to trust them, the ability to trust people that you don't know, is actually core to that process. And perhaps most importantly, out of all these different underlying features of innovation systems and systemic wealth we've discovered in our work, is love. And this is not love in like a cheesy sense. This is love in a profound sense, which is where do you draw your energy from? Do you love your work? Do you love what you do? Do you love creation? Do you love making things? Do you love the people around you? Do you love the mission? These are core to innovation, because without them, fear overtakes people. It's very easy to be afraid if you don't love what you do. So all these ideas are interesting because we end up with this very unusual conclusion, because economists for over 100 years have said things like love don't matter. If you, if you think back to the cotton boll weevil, what was the role of love in fighting boll weevils? It's not a whole lot. It was a little bit of passion on Seaman Knapp's part, but for everybody else, it was just a matter of taking those ideas and implementing them with precision and scale. But what we know now is that love actually creates serious economic value. It underlies the whole process of creation. And if you want to boil it down even more, if you go beyond love, there's, it really boils down to just two words, which are simply that you matter. When you think about all the things that we've gone through in our economic life, so much of our economic lives today feel like individuals actually don't have much of a role in the system, right? The system would go on just fine with or without you. 
But what we know about places like Silicon Valley, the experience out of studying this place, is that individuals, you have a profound role. And so if we think about creating wealth at a systemic level, at a community level, we've come up with this profound realization that you can, you can do all the investing you want into an economy. You can build infrastructure, you can build roads and bridges, give people broadband access. But ultimately, if you don't change the culture, if you don't think about how to build the invisible infrastructure of a community, you won't create sustainable wealth. People who are entrepreneurs know certain things to be true. So I'll leave you with these few insights, which are when you realize that living in rainforests is actually real economic value, you come up with a few conclusions. One, that handshakes are actually more durable than contracts. And two, that altruism can be more efficient than selfishness. And three, and perhaps most interestingly of all, silly things like trust and dreams and love, they actually do power the world. Thank you very much.